Hey everyone, welcome to a special edition of Birth Podcast. I wanted to pull a clip to share with you today where my friend Matt Willingham tells a story about he and I in Iraq. Now, this was during an event for Reckoning in the Rubble, my memoir that talks about the battle against ISIS. But Matt was working for an NGO at the time, and I was with them on a ride-along. And we found a moment of humor in the middle of the lament, in the middle of the morbid space that is death and war. And the truth is, sometimes humor isn't just a coping mechanism or a survival mechanism. Sometimes it's the way into our grief later on. It gives us a different way to process it. So listen in as Matt explains. I mean, I'm a I'm a kind of rural bumpkin Texas kid who ended up in Iraq wanting to help people. And the next thing you know, we're like being shot at. So it's like, oh, okay. Uh, I, 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 some of this was just, uh, we were just taking one step at a time and didn't necessarily know what the next step was going to be. But we had, a, we had a, a man with us who essentially acted as a fixer, but for like nonprofit. So he's a fixer basically. But, um, and he was willing to take us a little bit closer just to give us a sense of what uh, what hell is like. And so we just kind of kept going, kept going. And eventually we ended up in Shura. And I just remember we rolled up on that checkpoint and there was all that gunfire. And the soldiers just looked at us. And he was like, bunch of white people, are you, are you lost? <laughs> um, and it's one of those things where it was so like unnerving, you almost just kind of have to laugh at it. But we got there and eventually they came out and they they took us in. And like you said, there were just corpses everywhere. And it was one of the most, there were quite a few dystopian experiences along the front lines uh, of Iraq and then afterwards in, in Syria, but for me at least, but I would say that was, that was up there in terms of just, just sickening. I don't think I've been in many more other situations where it felt like humanity of people involved, including myself, was so stripped away so that we weren't people. There were no good guys and bad guys. There, it didn't feel that way anymore. Of course, you can tell yourself that story. Oh, ISIS are the bad guys. That's the easy story. And, and there's, there's a way to tell it where it's truthful. But at least for me, being in it, it was just a complete removal of any sense of we're all human. Like it just, I didn't feel human. Looking around, people didn't feel human. I don't know any other way to describe it. It was just, it was deeply sickening and saddening. So I guess I could go a little more in depth with that or share something I else? Do think, I, mean, I do think I do think one of the stories that? you you told and I actually liked the way that you told it but you you shared a story with me the other night that I hadn't necessarily forgotten but I, I guess I didn't quite bring into the space and that was we were in we were in a place that was hell and yet somehow there was some strange comedy that occurred in the moment that we entered the room with the police uh, we sat down to talk to them and get some information from them and figure out what they were doing. And Al Shoda was supposed to be cleared, um, but it wasn't. And and I, I you know I kind of thought that your sort of remembrance of that moment of what we were sort of experiencing in that moment, kind of that silent reaction, um, was kind of worth its weight in gold. Yeah, that was definitely a standout moment. So. There have been so many situations like this in Iraq, and then I also experienced it some in Syria and Somalia and some other pretty rough conflict zones where when I first encountered this, it was really borderline offensive to me, but that was just because I had no clue and ultimately had to realize, oh, I just need to slow down and listen here rather than being confused or offended by this. But I remember, well, let me back up. So I remember one time sitting with a sheikh. He's a, he, he was in Suleimania in Kurdistan, but he's originally from the south of Iraq. And I remember he and a bunch of his friends had fled for their lives and they were taking the time to remember some of their other sheikh friends who had been targeted by ISIS. They're Sufi, which is kind of a more mystical offshoot of, of Islam. I love it. It's beautiful. But they were very much persecuted. And they showed me on their phone a list that ISIS had released an order of importance of the sheikhs who were to be killed, no questions asked. And there was a bounty on their heads. Most of them were from Fallujah and uh, they had, most of them managed to, make it, managed to make it out, but they were sitting around remembering some of the friends who didn't make it out. And they were going through the list. And I just remember feeling like such a weight as these men, you know, turbans and the whole get up, just very regal, 
leaders in their communities, tribal, religious, ethnic leaders. And I just remember they were going around and, and talking about the list and they were remembering names and it was somber. And then one of the men, one of the most senior men said, I still can't believe they put you higher on the list than me. I'm so much more important. Look at my beard, it's gorgeous. And he doesn't even, he can barely grow a beard. He's a boy. And they rank him higher. Like they started cracking jokes. And it, in the moment I was like, this is really morbid. But like when you're sitting there and you're in that moment, I'm finally, I mean, Halan's laughing because he gets it, but like, I didn't get it. Like, so when you're sitting there and you're in that moment, you really have two options. You can, you can just sort of fall off a cliff into some kind of nihilistic despair, or you can just laugh. Like, what, what else are you gonna do? And so fast forward to Shura, there were so many moments like that, but this is one with you, Ash, where I just remember we looked at each other, but, but we were, we're in this police station and the police un unfortunately are in a situation wherein they are having to act as military. Um, and because the actual military had moved on closer to the actual Mosul city limits. And so we're in Shura. Um, and I just remember we were sitting there on the couch and you, you and I are kind of off in a corner or whatever, kind of paying attention or whatever, but very much just like, what's going on? How did we end up here? Why are we here? What's happening right now? And uh, I just remember there was, there was a, clearly some kind of bomb. I couldn't tell if it was an airstrike. Uh, I, I wasn't sure. I don't have like a trained ear necessarily. Was it a mortar uh, round? But it turns out it was a suicide bomber and there were only a few confirmed ISIS fighters left in the community and they were, they were clearing them. Um, and there was this, this pretty large explosion. And I just remember we, we kind of felt it. And I looked over at you, Ash, and then I looked over at this sergeant and I, I'm pretty sure he's a sergeant, but he was this is kind of short guy and he was just sitting down on the end of the couch and he just looked over at me and he just goes like with this ridiculous face a man had just blown himself up it, it's it's a horrifying reality but in the midst of that we're just sitting there and there's this quirky goofy little sergeant and he's making this goofy face it was just it was just weird like how many conflicting emotions you can end up having in that kind of environment it's almost like you're your limbic system and your, your brain is trying to figure out what emotion fits this situation. And it just doesn't know because it's like, this is, this is crazy. What, what are we supposed to feel or think about any of this? Um, and then after we had actually gotten back to, to Kurdistan or wherever it was that we went next, like, I just remember then all these emotions flooded of like what I kind of feel like I was supposed to feel or think in that moment. But like, I didn't, I didn't, it's almost like my brain had to catch up because I, so like what that guy did now, I look back at it and I can still kind of giggle because it's like, his face was just comically toad-like. I don't know how else to describe it, but then there's a moment I mean, of laughter all, and lament all the that corpses. Happens. Sorry. I said, there's just a moment of laughter and lament that happens. Like the laughter kind of happens first as the coping mechanism. And then your body catches up and going, oh, that's actually a really terrible thing. But I think that it's, it's our way. And, and to be honest with you, I think it's in a rocky way. Like I, when I reflect on just the Middle East and I reflect on Iraq and I, I listen and I watch Iraqi people, they're hilarious because they, they find that, that, that niche to, to laugh about the worst of circumstances because it helps them survive. You know, and, and I, yeah. it is morbid. It's not that it's not morbid. It's not that there's not grieving or mourning that has to happen or yeah. whatever. But totally, without a sense of laughter, I, I think that I think we would all be far more destitute. I mean, one of the things I've started saying is sometimes you need to laugh to be able to get to grief. You know, like a loved one dies and sometimes you need to be able to just sit around and tell goofy stories of crazy stuff they used to do or say. And then that helps you kind of get through to the harder stuff, but it's almost like a door. And I don't know, I'm grateful for those moments. There's so many moments with, with Iraqis, they're I mean, Kurds, Arabs, whoever, like they're just the most resilient and profoundly beautiful people I have ever encountered in my life. And I lived there for eight years. And if I could, I would go back right now. I hope that this gave you something to chew on as you go forward today. And if you want a link to the full conversation that we have on YouTube, I'll put that in the description box, as well as a place where you can go and get my book. Both of those links will be there. Check them out. And until next time, may you live and move and have your being.